sure you've gathered by now that approaching the SAT strategically will give you the upper hand in every section on the test. When you get through the SAT prep, you will love strategies so much, you'll wonder how you ever lived without them. I don't want to keep you waiting, so let's jump into strategies for the reading questions. First, a bit of bad news. The easy and hard questions are all mixed together. And now a bit of good news. You're allowed to flip back and forth between the passage and the questions. Think of this like an open book test. Your job is to cross off as many wrong answers as you can and then pick from the remaining choices. Crossing off the wrong answers is going to be essential. Often the answer that you would write if this were a fill in the blank test isn't going to be there. And if you go looking for it, you might drive yourself nuts. But if it's hard to find the right answer, it's often going to be easy to find at least one or two wrong answers. After all, this is an open book test. Pro tip time, if a question gives you specific line numbers, the answer probably won't be in those lines. Instead, it will be nearby. So, if a question asks you about lines 14 to 16, read lines 13 to 17, or the sentence before and the sentence after, so you can understand the context. Let's take a look at a practice problem. Remember, you're looking for an answer choice that you can support with evidence from the passage, so go find the evidence. This question comes from a passage about golfer Bobby Jones. When Jones commented about playing the ball as it lies, line 67, he was referring to A, his penalty stroke at the 1925 US Open, B, his debilitating disease, C, a fundamental rule of golf, or D, being honest. Let's go back to the passage and read the context. In this case, let's read lines 63 to 67. Although the disease filled his later years with pain, Jones stoically managed to continue to enjoy life. When asked how he coped with a painful spinal condition, his reply belied his suffering. Remember, we play the ball as it lies. We're looking for an answer choice that has something to do with his painful disease. We can cross off answer choices A, C, and D because they don't mention anything about a painful disease or spinal condition. That leaves us with B, which, sure enough, we can support with the evidence we found in the passage. Now that we know where to look, let's talk about what to look out for. And this brings us to our next pro tip. It's not enough for an answer to be true, it also needs to be correct. Some answer choices will be both true and wrong. True statements that have nothing to do with the passage, the question, or the correct answer. For an example, let's go back to that last problem. The question is asking us about playing the ball as it lies on line 67. Answer choice C says this line is referring to a fundamental rule of golf. Playing the ball as it lies is a fundamental rule of golf, so this answer choice seems true, but it doesn't answer the question. This is an example of an answer choice that is true but wrong. Something else to look out for are answer choices that are mostly right. Mostly right might sound pretty good, but that means that these answer choices aren't completely right, which means they're wrong. Remember, this is a reading test. It's just as important to read the answer choices correctly as it is to read the passage. Carefully read any answer choices that contain adjectives and or adverbs because these can change the meaning of an answer choice and can sometimes make an answer choice incorrect. The same rule applies if you see extreme words like always, never, or all in an answer choice. Be careful, extreme answers tend to be incorrect. As you do more practice, see more questions, and read carefully, you're going to start seeing a bunch of answer choices that would be correct if it weren't for one little word. One little always, or never, or adjective, or whatever that makes the choice wrong. Okay, so we've talked about where to look and what to look out for. Another thing to keep in mind is the perspective of the writer and or characters. Make sure you understand whose point of view the question is asking about. You already know that there can be a lot of valuable information in the introductory blurb that's given before each passage. One main takeaway from the blurb can be the point of view, or voice of the passage. For example, let's say that we're given a question about the point of view of two passages. The question asks, which of the following best explains the relationship between the passages? A, the author of passage one is speaking informally to a group of peers, whereas the author of passage two is not. B, both passages are written by members of disenfranchised groups. C, both the author of passage one and the author of passage two have been recently arrested. Or D, both are arguing for voting rights for African-American men. 
Let's take a look at the blurb. Passage 1 is adapted from Frederick Douglass, An Appeal to Congress for Impartial Suffrage, originally published in 1867. Douglass was a former slave. Passage 2 is adapted from a courtroom statement by Susan B. Anthony following her arrest for trying to vote at a time when women were prohibited from doing so, originally published in 1872. So it's stated that the author of Passage 1, Frederick Douglass, is an African-American man and that the author of Passage 2, Susan B. Anthony, is a woman. Both authors are members of groups whose rights they're fighting for, and since disenfranchise means to deprive people of the right to vote, we can say that both represent disenfranchised groups. Answer choice B says exactly that. Both passages are written by members of disenfranchised groups, so the correct answer is B. You may have come to the same conclusion without reading the blurb, but it would have definitely taken you much longer. Let's quickly look at the other answer choices and try to apply some of the strategies we've covered in this lesson. Pay close attention to the wording of the answer choices because one word, usually an adjective or adverb, can make the answer choice wrong. Looking at the question we already answered, we can identify some of these words that subtly change the meaning of the sentence. Take a look at answer choice D. Both are arguing for voting rights for African American men. From reading the blurb, we know that Susan B. Anthony was fighting to get women the right to vote. If we read the full passage, we would know that this statement doesn't argue for voting rights for any men. That one little word, men, makes answer choice D incorrect. Now let's look at answer choice A. The blurb tells us that the title of passage one is an appeal to Congress for impartial suffrage. That sounds pretty formal. Answer choice A contains an adverb. If we look at it carefully, we'll see informally is the opposite of what we'd be looking for. Also, Douglas was appealing to Congress, not a group of peers. So we found two good reasons to cross off answer choice A. Finally, we're going to talk about the stacked questions. In every passage, there will be at least one question that will ask you to identify the part of the text that best supports the answer for a previous question. These questions will be phrased something like, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? The answer choices will all be lines from the passage. When you see a stacked question, take your time to make sure you understood and correctly answered the previous question. If you did, then you probably already found the part of the text that best supports the answer. But sometimes there will be multiple parts that support the answer. Go through the answer choices one by one, cross off the wrong ones, and then make your best pick. This is all a lot of information, but the more you practice, the easier it will become for you to remember and apply these strategies. So make sure you practice at least a few of the hundreds of questions we have available in this course.